the man, the myth. Let's talk about David Lynch. I, you know, I consider myself a bit of a fan. Not in a worshipping level, but, you know, I, I've just always believed that he's an interesting filmmaker. Plus, he just made some damn fine coffee movies. Oh. First of all, I'm, I'm no expert. Frankly, I, I don't even get half of his movies. But I also don't think that you necessarily have to get all of his movies in order to enjoy them. So. Just to be clear, I'm not here to analyze his movies. I mean, for God's sake, like, a good while back, I found this analysis of Mulholland Drive, and it's literally 114 pages long. Jesus Christ, I mean, th that's not what we're gonna do here. Really, I'm, I'm mostly here just to tell you guys about how I experience his movies. And by movies, I mean his 10 feature-length movies. So, I, I won't be covering his shorts or his television series, but, um, still love you, Twin Peaks. Oh, that means that we're gonna start with Eraserhead. David Lynch actually started out as a painter, but slowly got into filmmaking when he wanted to get his, you know, like, bring his paintings to life. So he made a, he made a few shorts, which eventually led to the production of, well, Eraserhead. Um, in my, in my humble opinion, his signature work. As in, you know, when I think of David Lynch's movies, I usually instantly think of Eraserhead. So, um, what better way to start this video? Let's, uh, let's see. Oh yes, eraser head. First, um, this shot, you know, for the thumbnail. So, shot over the course of several years while Lynch was studying at the American Film Institute, eraser head is, Jesus Christ, it's, <laughs> it's quite the movie. We follow Henry Spencer living a mundane life in this industrial city. Then, all of a sudden, he's the father to a baby. Well, baby, it's, <laughs> damn, look at that, that's, ooh, that, that's creepy. And that all sucks, and, and his girlfriend can't take it anymore, and then some more weird shit happens? In other words, no, I have no idea what this movie is really about. I always just viewed it as like this, this industrial nightmare, Henry's nightmare. You know, about the, the rut of life with, with the expectations of working, getting married, starting a family. Sure, there's there's still so much that wouldn't add up in, in, in that scenario. I mean, what the heck is going on here? But. I feel like all this weirdness is just part of the nightmare. I mean, in dreams you also often don't question when things don't make sense, just like the characters in this movie don't do any of that. But yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say that this is definitely not for everyone. It's slow, it's, uh, well, you know, it's just so outside of the realm of traditional filmmaking. But that is exactly what I like about it. It's so timeless. It's not set in any particular time or place, not even really in this world. And the acting, I don't see it as per se good or, or bad, it just is. Like, I don't see actors performing, I just see the characters. It's like, well, well, let me put it this way, I just can't imagine a crew having worked on this movie. I really only see the end product, if that makes sense. So yeah, lots of memorable scenes in combination with this nightmarish sound design. Really, there's like this, this constant background noise going on, which really adds a, a dreadful feel to the movie. Um, the result is just a truly unique little movie. So, is there like a, a definitive explanation to this movie? Well, I remember a good while back I saw this or, or read this interview with David Lynch in which he said that in the 30 or so years since the release of the movie he had never read or, or, or heard an interpretation that corresponded with his original intentions. Might be a, a load of bullshit. I mean, you know, like, maybe the movie really isn't about anything. But it's, you know, maybe that's the beauty of it, but we'll probably never know. And nevertheless, whatever the movie means, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely an interesting watch, to say the least. So, while initially not widely released, the movie did become one of the original midnight movies of the late 70s, eventually confirming its status as a, a, a true cult movie. So, um, after this unexpected success of Eraserhead, David Lynch began working on a new script, the infamously never made Ronnie Rocket. But when no studio or no, no producer, nobody was willing to finance that movie, he got his hand on another script which he would be able to direct under the production of none less than Mel Brooks. But, um, this wasn't gonna be quite a comedy. It's, um, The Elephant Man. So, yeah, well, let's see. Let's, let's talk about The Elephant Man. 
quite the departure from his surreal debut film, The Elephant Man tells the true story of Joseph Merrick, a man living in the late 19th century who suffered from extreme deformities to the face and body. In the movie, he's first shown as this, this carnival freak show exhibition, but then we're being introduced to Dr. Frederick Treves, played by Anthony Hopkins, who wants to borrow him for an examination and eventually secures for him a place in the London hospital. Initially, his, his intentions are somewhat ambiguous, you know, based on the way he speaks about him. But at no time have I met with such a perverted or degraded version of a human being as this man. But soon it seems like he actually does have the right intentions. Not often mentioned when talking about Lynch filmography, this is actually a fantastic movie. It looks beautiful, you have a nice soundtrack, great performances all around. Uh, John Hurd as the Elephant Man, oh man, he, he really turns him into a, a very sympathetic character that you just can't help but to feel for. I got used to be treated so well by a beautiful woman. Besides that, it, it's just a fascinating story, perfectly illustrating both the good and bad side of people. And seeing the good side really makes it almost like a feel-good movie. But then there's also the bad side, which really makes you want to punch people in the face. It's, it's this combination, I think, which makes it such an engaging movie. Like I said, quite unlike his previous movie, but there's still some surreal-ish scenes at the beginning and the end, and, and, and this creepy dream sequence. Besides that, it may not be the most Lynchian movie in his body of work, but that definitely doesn't mean that you shouldn't give it a watch. I mean, 8 Academy Award nominations for your sophomore movie? That's not bad. It really isn't. Yeah. I'm definitely worth checking out. And well, on that note, I quickly want to take a moment to give a shout out to my little buddy Anthony and his YouTube channel. He's this, this huge David Lynch fan and well, he has his own review of The Elephant Man, which goes, you know, like a little more in depth than mine. Plus, he told me that there's more David Lynch stuff coming up, like this montage, which he also did for other actors like uh, Kubrick and, and Lars von Trier. The thing is, for no apparent reason, a bunch of haters, I guess, uh, dislike his videos. Y you know, making it hard for him to get more exposure on his channel. So, you know, check out his videos, uh, give him a thumbs up, uh, tell him I send you. I'll, uh, I'll leave a link in the video description. So, um, with, with all of that out of the way, let's continue with the next movie, the, the oddball in the David Lynch filmography, June. Adapted from one of the best-selling science fiction novels of all time, this movie, again, is quite the departure from his previous work. Well, um, let's, let's take a look at that, huh? Ah, June. The movie has such an infamous production history, with different producers and directors like Ridley Scott and Alejandro Jodorowsky at different points being attached to the movie, until finally, under the production of Dino de Laurentiis, David Lynch got the job. So, the original Frank Herbert novel, it's a thick one, so trying to stop all of that in, in one movie, it'll tend to get a little complex. Basically, it's the year 10,000 something, and there's a bunch of different planets and races. One planet, Arrakis, or June, is the only planet in the whole world <laughs> where, where you can find this specific spice, which is basically the most sought after thing in the whole universe, since it can extend lifespan and, well, make interstellar travel possible. Woo. So these two rifling races, they go there to take control and, and then there's all silly sci-fi fights. I don't know, man. I mean, I enjoy all the, the big sets and the, the costume and makeup designs, but besides that, this movie didn't really do it for me. I feel like most of the political and, and moral themes of the original novel are lost, so now you're left with a story that's, well, well not per se silly, but the way it's presented, the, the looks, the effects, it didn't age all that well. So yeah, it, it is all pretty silly. There's this huge battle near the end, which was, I imagine, supposed supposed to be super epic, but it was mostly just super silly. The cast is interesting though. You have Patrick Stewart, Sting, lots of, of beautiful actresses, fucking Willard from motherfucking Pieces, <laughs> some, some more familiar faces, and of course a young Cal McLaughlin in his first of several David Lynch collaborations. I, I, I do always enjoy his performances. And the, the big ass worms on the, on the June planet, they're pretty cool. But Besides that, 
this movie really didn't have that much to offer for me and and the only one time that I've seen it I found myself you know halfway through mostly just waiting for it to be over with and well that's that's Never a good sign. But hey, um, at least I'm not alone. I mean, David Lynch himself, he basically disowned the movie. You know, like like taking his name off the credits of some of the other edits, like like the one made for TV. So yeah, I think it's um, it's pretty safe to say that this is most likely the least popular of the, the David Lynch movies. So I think we should just um move on. Which is good because the next movie, well, basically marks the, the return or maybe even the, the beginning of his, his true signature style. You know, that, that, that Lynchian vibe we've, we've come to expect from his movies. This, of course, is uh, Blue Velvet. Again under the production of Dino De Laurentiis, who, in, in return for a, a, a somewhat smaller budget, uh, offered David Lynch basically total creative freedom, which he obviously like gladly accepted, especially after the, the both commercial and critical failure of Dune. Well, um, sounds, uh, sounds promising. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Ah, won't you look at that. Such a happy, perfect world. That is, until our central character, Kyle McLaughlin again, this time a, a little cooler with a with an earring, finds a, well, a, a severed ear. Hmm. And, well, after bringing it to the police station, he finds out through the detective's daughter, played by the adorable, at the time, 19-year-old Laura Dern in, in her first Lynch collaboration, that this, this singer who lives nearby might be involved with the whole case. So, intrigued by this whole mystery, Kyle decides to break into the woman's apartment, and, well, soon he's in a little too deep. So, um, let me just get it out of the way and please don't lynch me for this one. But I do think that this movie might be a little bit overrated. Don't get me wrong though, I mean, I think it's, it's a great movie. I simply just do not love it as much as many other people do. Still, I appreciate it for, for all the right reasons, I think. The, the, the 50s noir theme, the, the characteristic dreamlike atmosphere, and of course, Dennis Hopper as the maniacal Frank Booth. He's, oh man, he's quite the memorable villain. I'll fuck anything that moves! <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, Frank, calm down. What kind of beer do you like? Heineken. Heineken? Fuck that shit! Uh, um, um, I'll agree a little more with that one. <laughs> I also like how, after the previous two movies, this one is, again, an original story. Ah, we, we finally get a peek in the mind of David Lynch again, and, well, there's some there's some dark stuff going on in there. I mean, all the, the voyeurism and, and violence, sexual violence, especially at the time, was uh, quite controversial. <sighs> ah, I don't know, it's... It's a good movie. I mean, the acting might not be the best, and I didn't really understand Kyle's character. I, I guess he was just training to become a, a Dale Cooper. Oh. Um, some of the themes and, and symbolisms, they were a little obvious. Sometimes the movie drags a little, but I can forgive all of that, as long as you have a somewhat sober Dennis Hopper reviving his career with probably one of his best performances. Hustin' your love letter. Straight from my heart, fucker! Do you know what a love letter is? It's a bullet from a fucking gun, fucker! Man, he's yeah, he's he's quite a show stealer. I mean, he's oh, he's so quotable and, and crazy and, and unpredictable. Except that you can probably expect to get punched in the face. Yeah. And please. Please don't get me wrong, I, I, I do really like this movie. Plus, it's, it's the first time we have Angelo Badalamenti on the, the ones and twos. I mean, this, this movie does truly feel like a, a, a real David Lynch movie. And you know where earlier in this video I said, like, in my opinion, I feel like Eraserhead might be the, the signature David Lynch movie? A lot of people would argue that it's actually this one, the Blue Velvet. So yeah. Um, by the time the next movie came out, we've entered the 1990s. Which means that, that David Lynch, together with Mark Frost, created this, this little television show, I don't know, maybe maybe you've heard of it? It's uh, Twin Peaks. Ah, oh, I love that show. But like I said, we're not here to talk about um, series or, or shorts, we're gonna keep it to movies. So if, if anything, we'll start the, the second part with, with Firewall with me. But first, for now, Wild at Heart. Another adaptation from a novel, but with some of Lynch's own ideas thrown in the mix. Well, uh, no, let's take a look. Well, the movie starts rather intense, with Nicolas Cage beating up this guy quite beyond repair. <laughs> Damn, son, that, that, that'll definitely land him in, in prison. But 
After some two years, he's out and being awaited by his girlfriend, Lula, played by Laura Dern. Her mother isn't pleased, to say the least, about all of this. So Sailor, that, that's his name, Sailor, and Lula, they go on a road trip to the West Coast. That's, that's basically the whole story. And then, you know, during this trip, they run into all kinds of adventures and, well, mostly trouble. To me, this movie always felt more like a, a collection of, of different short ideas rather than one continuous story. And then, you know, all involving this, this hypersexualized Bunny and Clyde type of couple that's just trying to find love in a doomed world or like doomed scenario. <laughs> the characters are so over the top though with their thick accents. Ain't you ever curious why your mom's got this fixation on keeping us apart? <laughs> but Nicolas Cage as this Elvis Presley inspired cool masculine guy, he is pretty entertaining. It all also makes it a little silly though. Th there's some random lynch weirdness. Yeah. And this, this kind of forced Wizard of Oz reference or theme throughout. But it's entertaining. Willem Dafoe is in it. Oh man, he's awesome as this John Waters mustache rocking sleaze bag. Isabella Rossellini is back again, who we saw earlier in, in Blue Velvet. And since this movie was shot during the production on Twin Peaks, there's also a few cameos. As well as Jack Nance, but you know, he's he's always around. Rest in peace. It's honestly, it's it's okay. In the end, it, it all feels a little pointless. There's lots of untied, you know, like loose ends to several subplots that were brought up, but it's entertaining. Mostly due to the somewhat over the top nature of all the, the different characters. Besides that, I, I really don't know what I can tell you about this one. It's definitely not one of the most memorable David Lynch movies, but in my opinion, also definitely not his worst. You, you can give it a watch. Like I said, it's it's entertaining, albeit perhaps a little unsatisfying once you're done with it. But hey, um, that's, that's life. And well, that brings us to the end of this first video about the films of David Lynch. I'll be back in the in the second part where I'll be taking a look at the, the five remaining movies. And well, that's, that's basically all I have for now. So um, I'll see you guys then next time. Cheers.